You saw it here first, a paradigm shift right in front of your very eyes. <laughs> you noticed it was an occasional film. I am one of the co-founders of the Asynchronous Research Center, so we think that things should happen when they should happen. We recently got some funding from a government agency who thought that reports should not be occasional but should be quarterly, which appears to me to be contrary to the spirit of the Asynchronous Research Center. So far in a year, we've produced three occasional reports. Uh, I suppose over the next year, we'll have to produce occasional reports at the first of every quarter. But nevertheless, synchrony is a special case of asynchrony. And so I guess we can do that okay. We'll still call them occasional reports. The occasion will just be dictated by the calendar. Fred Brooks is one of my heroes. And Fred said to me one day, he said, uh, it's not that I'm not planning to retire. I know what I've forgotten to do. Do you see the green light? I had forgotten that. OK, so Fred said, it's not that I'm not planning to retire. He said, it's that I'm planning not to retire. And I thought that was a pretty good slogan. So when I left Sun about 18 months ago, I thought, uh, what am I going to do? And Marley wanted to move to Portland, so we moved to Portland. And we went in to see the acting dean there and said, we'd like to start a research organization in your engineering college, and he said, fine. And so the Asynchronous Research Center was born. We've had some support from a variety of organizations, and we're up and rolling. We have three or four students working with us now, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what we'll be doing, and I think it's going to be exciting. The next many years in computing are going to be as exciting or perhaps more exciting than the past has been. I want to talk today about two paradigms that, as we say in Pittsburgh, need shifted. Those of you from Pittsburgh recognize that the words to be do not exist in the Pittsburgh vocabulary. I gave a talk at CMU one time in which I pointed out that in Pittsburgh you say, this car needs washed. And somebody from the audience corrected me and said, that's not right. In Pittsburgh you say, this car needs washed. <laughs> so I stand corrected. But here's a couple of paradigms that need shifted. The first one has to do with sequence. We live in a computer age in which sequence is all important, in which we think about computers as sequential machines. And we find concurrency hard to deal with and perhaps because it is not fundamental to our thinking. I want to talk a little bit about how we got to this place, why we're stuck in it, why it's hard to escape, and why it doesn't fit today's technology. And I want to talk a little bit about an alternative that I've been considering for the last several years. As in all pieces of research, it's not at all clear to me that I've got the right idea. But at least I've got an idea that's different from the current idea. And it has a hope that there might be something there. I, I intend to explore it for a while and try and discover if there is something there. I think we can blame sequential programming, se the sequential view of computing, on Morris Wilkes who built EDSAC, ran its first stored program on the 6th of May in the year 1949, 1949. I was 11 years old at the time and unaware of that momentous event. It's now more than 60 years later, and that legacy is still with us. EDSAC was built with vacuum tubes, and it had a mercury delay line memory. 
random access memories had not yet been invented. And so naturally it was sequential. It was sequential for two reasons. The Mercury delay line provided its memory, provided data in sequence. That was inherent in the fact that sound in the mercury was then picked up by a microphone and recirculated to the, to the transducer at the other end, so it went down the delay line again. And in a mercury delay line, you could store a few thousand bits. It was sequential inherently. Vacuum tubes were expensive, and so the logic in EDSAC had to be used for everything. And since there was only one set of logic, you had to use it sequentially. And Morris Wilkes did just the right thing. He built a sequential computer. It was appropriate to the technology of the day. Now, Morris is very British. And he told me the story once of writing the very first computer program. He said, I wrote the very first computer program. It was a program for computing prime numbers. He said, I put it into the computer in the full expectation that it would work. And then he pauses for a minute, and then he says, it was then I discovered debugging. <laughs> it came as quite a shock to Morris that he might spend a large fraction of the rest of his life seeking and rooting out attention in essentially trivial bugs in complicated codes. Now, I know that in this group, this is an experience you've never had because your software always works perfectly the first time, right? Gradually, computer languages began to grow up. And the computer languages all followed the sequential model. It was the natural thing to do. It was what computer people did. It was how we thought. We now find ourselves needing to think about concurrency. And yet, we're stuck in this sequential paradigm. The equipment that we use is essentially sequential even to this day. The programming languages that we use, nearly all of them, are essentially sequential. Certainly sequential in a fundamental way. We train our students to think sequentially. Indeed, we even self-select for our ranks those who think well sequentially. How do you join this group? By being able, very good, at thinking sequentially. Graduate student said to me one day, you know, maybe that's the problem. Maybe the computer profession is so filled with people who think sequentially because people who can think concurrently never entered the profession. It's a very shocking idea. It may be that we aren't the right group to think concurrently. I hope that's not true. I hope that those of us who've learned to think sequentially can learn something different, some other way of thinking about things. But it's hard. My experience over a career of research is it's been pretty easy to learn things. It's been very hard to unlearn things. This is the way we've always done it. Why shouldn't we continue doing it that way? <clears throat> The world is full of organizations, particularly commercial ones, whose executives said, we must be doing something right. Look, we're making all this money, only to find that somebody else does something differently and overturns the economics of the folk who have been doing the same thing for a long time and cannot change. Do you remember RCA? RCA used to make television sets. Sarnoff ran the finest industrial laboratory in the country, the RCA laboratory, called, now called Sarnoff Labs, and it's been sold to SRI. There is a remnant of RCA around. It's called NBC, and it belongs to the General Electric Company. RCA is essentially gone. I think RCA failed to make the transition into the integrated circuit era. When I was in high school, I used to buy RCA vacuum tubes. They came in little red and black boxes about that big. 
and I used them for various electronic projects that I was doing. And then I was able to buy RCA transistors. They made some transistors. They came in little red and black boxes. But I was never able to buy RCA integrated circuits. I think the technology passed them by, and they weren't alert enough to unlearn what they knew and learn something different. Having selected people for sequential thinking and trained them in sequential thinking, we have a problem in moving to something else. But what we have doesn't fit very well with today's technology. Let us think for a minute about what an integrated circuit technology offers us. It offers us essentially free logic. I get a billion transistors on a chip. Each of those transistors can perform a logic function. And so logic is now essentially free. Contrast that with the time when Morris Wilkes built his machine, when vacuum tubes were expensive, unreliable, bulky, and just a bloody nuisance. In Morris Wilkes's day, wires were free. They were pieces of copper covered with some kind of plastic that you just stuck wherever you wanted. And compared with the speed of the vacuum tubes, they were essentially instant. On an integrated circuit today, if you take the cover off and look at the inside of an integrated circuit, what do you see? You see wires. You see a dozen layers or so of densely packed wires, which connect the billion transistors into the pattern that's useful to do logic. And buried underneath those transistors, uh, underneath those wires, you will find the transistors. Where does the energy go when an integrated circuit does its job? It goes into charging and discharging the electrical capacitance of those wires. And you can figure out what the energy of an integrated circuit chip is just by counting how many wires there are and figuring out how often each of them is going to change from one voltage to another, and thereby calculate how much energy is going to be dissipated. Now, the energy isn't actually dissipated in the wires, but it's forcing the wires to wiggle around that takes the energy. You can think of this as the problem of the weightlifter who has to press 300 pounds. He will sweat when he does that because he had to put a lot of energy into that weight to lift it. And then he has to take that energy back out into his muscles when he sets the weight back down again. The energy is dissipated in him, but it's the weight that's the cause of the energy dissipation. And similarly, the energy is dissipated in the transistor, sure enough. But the cause of the energy dissipation is the wires. And most people think that Electricity in a wire goes at the speed of light. Let me disillusion you. In an integrated circuit, the wire is very thin, and it has a lot of electrical capacitance around it. And so the speed of light has nothing to do with how fast a signal goes through an integrated circuit wire. Rather, it's the speed at which the charge, the number of electrons that's delivered at one end of the wire, can ooze down the wire and charge all the capacitance that's on the side of the wire. You've all had the experience of turning on the hot water faucet and it takes a while before the water becomes hot. The hot water from your hot water tank has to fill the capacity of the pipe that takes the water to the faucet before you begin to see hot water. And similarly, the electrons have to fill the capacity of the wire before the signal can get to the far end. And it turns out that the time delay in an integrated circuit wire varies with the square of the length and not linearly with the length. And so the obvious thing to do is to put repeaters. If you figure out, you can do the math fairly easily and find out that every so often, if you have a long wire, the delay in the long wire is going to be the square of the length, so that's going to get pretty awful as the wire gets longer. So you break the wire into pieces, and you put a repeater, you put some transistors that 
receive the signal from the first piece of wire and then drive the signal into the second piece of wire. And if you put those at the proper spacing, you can send the signal through a long communication channel made of many shorter wires at the fastest possible speed. Well, you know, Morris Wilkes developed a programming system which had nothing to say about communication at all. And today, communication is the energy cost, it's the area of the chip, and it's the delay. All factors which didn't enter into the original thinking about computing. And which of our programming languages says very much about communication? Hmm. Most computing languages are almost silent on communication. Yes, we have load and store. And occasionally we have some prefetch things that we could say. But our ability to talk in our computer languages about communication is woefully deficient. The technology has simply overtaken our software thinking and our software position. And we haven't noticed until recently because our computers kept getting faster at a fast enough rate that it satisfied our appetite for computing. But today, the improvements in the circuits themselves no longer satisfy our need for computing, and so we're turning to concurrency as the fond hope for getting more computing done in the same amount of time. So I ask the question, is concurrency inherently difficult? Is the sequential model right in some fundamental sense? Or is it a matter of our thinking? Or is it some combination of those things that gives us grief? I've tried to think about concurrent things a lot. I design integrated circuits and I try and make all of the stuff in my designs do things at once. And I find it quite hard to think about. And that makes me worry that maybe there's something in thinking about concurrency that doesn't fit my mind. I don't think that's it, though. I think we just don't have the right languages to express what we need to express. I was reading a book recently called Blink. It's written by the guy who wrote The Tipping Point. And he talks about the Pepsi taste test. Remember, Coca-Cola was concerned and Pepsi had a smaller share of the market and introduced the notion of the, tape te the taste test. Give your victim two unmarked glasses, one filled with Coke and one filled with Pepsi, and see which one they prefer. And the author says an even harder test is the three glass test, in which you give your victim three glasses, two of which are filled with one beverage, and one is filled with the other beverage, never mind which is which. And you ask your victim to tell you which two are the same, never mind distinguishing Coke from Pepsi, just tell me which two glasses are the same. And he points out that this is very hard to do because you have to remember taste number one until you've tasted number three. And remembering what a taste is like is very difficult unless you have a vocabulary to identify the parts of the taste. And he said professional tasters do this very easily because they have a way to think about what the tastes are. They have a language which talks about sweetness and tartness and all kinds of things that aren't in the vocabulary of ordinary people. And it may be that we're just missing something, some way of thinking about and describing concurrency that will make it seem a lot easier. Now there is a painless form of concurrency. No doubt all of you have used a pipe in Unix. Pretty painless, isn't it? I've got three operations I want to do. I want to do 
you know, a grep followed by a diff followed by something else. And I just pipe them together. And the resulting stuff all runs concurrently. It's just very happy to do its thing without even hardly having to think about it. Now, what is it that the pipe talks about? What is the communication element? What is the descriptive element in the pipe? If I remember, it's that double arrow, right? Which says, is connected to. This is not a logic operation. This is a communication operation. And I assert that what's missing from our vocabulary is communication. Today, communication is much more expensive than logic. And I think it's high time that our computer languages started talking about communication explicitly. And until we're able to do that, I think concurrency is going to remain hard. Now, the hardware that we get today, although it presents a sequential model to the programmer, is anything but sequential. The hardware designers are not stupid, and they've spent a great deal of effort and a great many transistors trying to anticipate the needs of a sequential program to keep cache memories stoked with the right stuff and to make sure that everything can be done as quickly as possible when asked for. Sometimes at expense of energy, but never mind. But they don't tell us, the programmers, what they're doing under the covers. And so, for example, people with large numeric codes do a great many experiments to figure out how big cache is and what the cache replacement algorithm is so that they can figure out how to partition their matrices for optimum performance. And I think that if we're going to talk about communication in a programming language, we need to have access to the communication tasks that our machines are doing, tasks which are now largely hidden from the software. And because they're largely hidden from the software, the software has no control over them. And so sometimes they work just as they're intended to and make everything work nice and smoothly but sometimes they work to our disadvantage. And I believe we're going to have to provide more hooks for software, for operating systems, for particularly for big codes, into the communication network that lies in our machines. One place that nearly every machine has communication hidden from the programmer is the three address instruction. When I say add, register 1 to register 2 and put the answer in register 3, that implies three communications. The machine hardware has to look up the value in register 1, a little random access memory there, deliver that piece of information to the adder, look up the information in register 2, deliver that information to the adder, and then take the result of the addition and deliver it back to register three. Three separate communication tasks, each of which consumes energy. And suppose that what I really want to do is to add three numbers together rather than two. Wouldn't it make more sense to allow me, the programmer, to say, don't bother with that third communication because I've got a fourth one from register five, just going to come that I want to add in in the adder as well. And triple additions are not all that uncommon. That's just an example of the kind of thing that is built into our thinking about machines, which I think is getting in the way of a new world where we might think about computing differently. It seems clear to me that the integrated circuit technology that we have cries out for a communication-centric rather than operation-centric view of computing. It's the communication that costs time and energy. Why aren't we, the programmers, in charge of that expensive thing? 
Morris Wilkes did exactly the right thing. The expensive part of his machine was logic. And so he put the programmer in charge of logic. But the expensive part has changed. And I allege that, that today we're about in the position of the first iron bridge makers who said we've always made bridges out of stone and the convenient shape for a stone bridge is an arch. And so sure enough, some 200 years ago, the first iron bridge appeared in England. And if you look at it, guess what? It's an arch bridge. It's made out of cast iron instead of stone, but there it is. And the kind of bridge that appears in downtown Boston now with cables that run from a central tower down to hold the deck up, they're not very big. They're this size, right? And they hold the whole roadway up. You can't do that without high strength steel. But that's a form of bridge that had to be invented when the new materials became available. And it's remarkable to me how long it takes us as human beings to change our thinking to accommodate new capabilities of new stuff. And by the way, tends to be younger people who do it. Tends to be younger people who adopt texting I have sent perhaps a dozen text messages in my entire life. I can barely triple tap, and I'll bet there are people in this room who can triple tap nearly as fast as I can type. But that's okay. I mean, we live in a free enterprise economy, and the wonderful part of free enterprise is that if two or three people have a better idea of how to do something, they are allowed to form a corporate structure build themselves the new product and put it on the market. And if people like it, they're able to displace the incumbents. And so old guys like me may be forced to retire as just being unable to keep up. Please force me into retirement by figuring out how to do concurrency so that you know I have, will have no point in working on the problem. That would be a wonderful result. Now, I think that the, the sequential paradigm will eventually give way to something else. And I allege that the something else is going to be a communication-centric view of computing. And the principal design driver that I'm working on at Portland State is a completely different computer organization, unlike anything you've ever seen, where the programmer does not program instructions but rather configures communication paths. I call this machine Fleet. The name was originally invented as a pun between fleet of foot, fast in other words, and a fleet of computing equipment doing coordinated things under the charge of some kind of communication control like a fleet of ships in the ocean. The unfortunate part of that nomenclature is that the acting elements, the ships as we call them, don't actually move. So you have to think of each ship as a factory. It's permanently docked in its position and there's some kind of a communication network that connects a road network, if you will, with trucks that run on it that connects all of these ships so that any ship can send information to any other. And each ship does a particular job. We might have a ship that's able to add and subtract. We might have a ship that's a small memory that's able to look up information. We might have a ship that controls a large memory. We might have a special purpose ship that does some cryptographic operation. And so on. And what the programmer does is to control what the trucks do that carry the information between the ships. So there is a straw boss in each dock who, that takes information from the factory ship, puts it into a truck, and dispatches it to somewhere else. And it's that dispatch operation, that configuration of the communication network that is the key to making fleet useful. How many ships are there? Probably several thousand. 
And this kind of machine is inherently concurrent because when you send in information to each of those straw bosses on each dock to tell him what to do with information that he gets from his factory ship, where to send it. You send all those pieces of information to the straw boss at the same time, concurrently. You just send them all out. And every straw boss sits there and waits until a piece of information comes out of his ship and puts it in a truck and s gives the truck a packing slip or a routing slip and off the truck goes to take it somewhere else. And when the, ship when the truck arrives at an input port of a ship, it simply takes its information and stuffs it into the ship. And when the ship has got enough information, the factory's got enough information to do its thing, it does its thing and produces an output. And if you get the idea that this is kind of a streaming process, you're exactly right. Information will flow through this machine according to some pattern. Because the communication network is very simple, we need to provide flow control so that we don't end up making the communication network a total bottleneck and totally congested. It's easy to imagine if these trucks all go on the Boston highways that it may take them a long time to get from here to Peabody, depending on the other traffic. So we provide flow control so that we don't launch one of these trucks until we know that there's space for it to, to take its information. And this pattern of communication is highly reconfigurable. That is to say, I can tell the straw boss for the output of an adder, send the first piece of information that comes out of this adder over to you know, some other place, to George and then wait for more instructions from me. So on a communication by communication base, I can reconfigure the communication paths. But all the time, I'm thinking about the communication paths and allowing the factories to do whatever they are built to do. I don't think very much about the logic, except in as much as where I send the data determines what's going to happen to it. So that's the big idea. And maybe it'll work. I know there are some things that it's going to be really good at. We've examined the possibility of making it sort, for example. A lot of computer programs spend a lot of time sorting data. It's a biggie. And if you want to sort a number of data elements, let's say n data elements, we know that it takes n log n comparisons to do that sorting job. And if we happen to have log n comparators hooked in some kind of a string, we ought to be able to do that sorting job at the same speed as the communication network in other words, if we have multiple computing elements, we could string them in a string. They would all be doing their thing concurrently, but we would never have to think about that concurrency because like the pipe in Unix, we can treat this as a pipeline kind of operation without having to think about forks and other nasty and hard to think about concurrency ideas. So how many little factory ships do you think there should be on a chip? Well, these are all lots smaller than a whole core processor, which has to have arithmetic and cache memories and all kinds of stuff. And so one can easily contemplate having a few thousand of them. And so how many adders should you have? Well, it depends how much addition you're doing, but there's to be a mix of these things in which there would be no type of factory for which there are fewer than three instances. And why do I say that? Because how do I test that the factories are working? Well, if I have three of them, I can give them the same input data and see if they produce the same results. And then since they're all fairly small and the probability of anyone failing is finite, 
if they all produce the same results, I have pretty good confidence that they're all working. And if one of them produces results different than the other two, I can be pretty sure he's failing. And then my program can simply not use him. Well, that's the idea. Now, embedded in that idea of concurrency, I said somewhere, the straw boss at the output dock waits until a piece of data emerges from the factory ship. And that's a key message, waits. This kind of system will only work if everybody can wait until he is A, told what to do, and B, has enough data to do it. That's not how we build machines today. We build machines today such that they march like soldiers to the beat of a clock. And when you buy a piece of computing equipment, it's at 2.2 gigahertz something or other. And that 2.2 gigahertz describes the number of beats per second of the clock of that system. I remember I used to watch the marching band at the University of Pittsburgh. And they were world renowned for marching on the field at 180 beats per minute, which is a very fast march indeed. The unit of human speech rate is the Lampson. Anybody here know Butler Lampson? Butler Lampson speaks faster than nearly any human being I've ever met. And so I measure human speech rate in Lampsons. I'm speaking to you today at about 0.6 Lampsons. <laughs> Butler speaks at one Lampson. That's a normalized unit. I don't know anybody who speaks in excess of one, which is why it's a useful unit. Now, if we don't have the beat of a clock, how are we going to measure the speed of a piece of equipment? And this is the second paradigm that I want to talk about that needs shifted. It's the notion that computers should march to the beat of a clock like a military organization. And I'd like to talk a little bit about how it came about that that's how we build equipment. And I'd like to talk a little bit about how it's hard to get out of the cul-de-sac of clocked computing. There are some advantages to getting out of that cul-de-sac. Energy is but one of them. So how did we get there in the first place? Well, when I first started building equipment, we built equipment that was made of printed circuit cards with some integrated circuits on them, maybe a dozen or so. And we plugged those into what we call the back panel, which was a panel this size. And it had sockets in it for the cards to plug in. And each of the sockets had a raft of pins sticking out the back. And by that time, the telephone company had figured out the most reliable and easiest to apply mechanism for attaching wires to those pins. Each pin was square. And you had a little tool that looked like a power drill that was called a wire wrap gun. And at the end, it had a shaft that would turn around, and the shaft had two holes in it. One hole was big enough to go over the pin, and the other hole was just big enough to hold the end of a piece of copper wire in it. So you'd stick, so you'd take the insulation off the wire, stick it in the wire wrap gun, and you put the wire wrap gun on the pin and pull the trigger, and, brrrp, and it would wrap the piece of copper wire around the pin 10 times. And the pin had sharp corners. And so there were 40 places where the copper wire was indented by the pin. And so as long as at least one of those made a connection, the connection was good. And it turns out anybody could do this. You just stick the wire in, stick it on, and it comes out perfect every time. Very reliable. The phone company figured this out. It was wonderful. And so we used to put wires on these back panels. And when you looked at the back of the back panel, there was a maze of wiring on there. And one of the problems, of course, was did we get them all in the right place? Well, we had to check that very carefully. And sometimes there was a bug, and we'd have to take the wires off. By the way, you could unwrap them. We had an unwrapping tool. You just untwist this spiral of wire. But when you were finished, you had no idea 
which wire was adjacent to which other one because every panel that you built was slightly different. And unfortunately, when signals propagate at the speeds that signals propagated even then, adjacent wires talk to each other through their mutual capacitance and mutual inductance. And so whenever Pete sent a piece of information to George, okay, Joan and Mary, whose wire happened to go adjacent to it, got a little piece of noise like the noise you sometimes hear on a phone circuit. And that noise was annoying because sometimes it would cause errors. And the solution to that was really quite simple. It was called a clock. What you did was everybody had a piece of data that it wanted to transmit, and we said to everybody, transmit now. And there was chaos on the back panel. All these signals were rattling around there. And they were all driven quite hard, and so they all got reliably to the end. And then we didn't send any more signals until the next clock period. We let chaos reign for a while, and when chaos had died out, then we did it again. And we had to do that because we didn't know who was cross-talking to, to who. And then some wonderful things happened. My, what an amazing simplification for the designer. He could send information from anywhere to anywhere on this entire back panel without having to think about timing. The price he paid for that was he only got to send information when the clock happened. But never mind, he didn't have to worry about whether the signal was going a short distance or a long distance, he could just go it. And so a whole bunch of design tools and a whole field of thought grew up saying this is the way to build machines. And a few crazy people tried to build machines in other ways and they often failed for a variety of reasons, one of them being electrical noise. And so we grew up in a synchronous world and we trained our students in synchronous design and we got our design tool companies, our CAD companies, to provide tools for this form of design. And that's what we do today. But I notice that the wires on an integrated circuit are the same in different copies of the circuit. And so maybe the initial reason why synchronous design was a good idea no longer exists. And moreover, synchronous design has a very nasty property, which is when the clock hits, everybody is talking at once, and so they draw a pulse of power from the power supply, very great. And then, till the next clock period, there's very little energy draw. And it's hard to build a power supply that will serve this kind of load. Everybody talked when they wanted to. We would have kind of the buzz that you get in a cocktail party. And the level of intensity of the sound would be about the same. The level of power consumption would be about the same over time and wouldn't have these spikes. That would reduce radio interference radiation. It would simplify the construction of power supplies and it might ease a whole bunch of other things. So that's a reason why synchronous design might not be the thing for the future. But the big part of synchronous design is it allows you to think about simultaneity. When the clock hits, everything happens simultaneously. But now wait a minute, on an integrated circuit, how long does it take to send a signal from one corner of the integrated circuit to the other corner? And the answer is about a dozen clock periods. And so the notion of simultaneity on a modern integrated circuit just ain't there. We don't have simultaneity anymore. And so we are forced to think somehow differently. We're forced to think that time has to be treated as a more or less continuous variable rather than a quantized variable. And where we are determines when we see things. If this sounds a little bit like Einstein's relativity, you bet it is, it exactly is. The notion that two things happen simultaneously 
at the kind of speed of an integrated circuit on different parts of the integrated circuit is absurd for physical reasons. Because if I observe those two things, where I stand depends on what sequence I see them in. So the other paradigm that I'd like to see change is a paradigm which says, let us let things take as long as they want instead of forcing them into this rigid model. That's a little harder to think about because now we have to think about time in a different way. And we have to think about priority in a different way. What does priority mean in an asynchronous world? Well, if you and I approach a door, and I'm the senior person and you're you know, a polite younger person, you'll always obviously defer to me and let me go through the door first. Well, now wait a minute. If you arrive at the door today and I don't arrive till tomorrow, do you wait for me? Of course you don't. How about if you arrive at 1 o'clock and I arrive at 2 o'clock, you don't wait for me? How about you arrive at 1 o'clock and I arrive a half a second after you? I'm right behind you as we approach the door. Well, then you defer to me, right? So there must be some time interval between half a second and an hour when you decide whether or not you're going to go through the door first. How do you decide? Do I have priority or not? It depends on when. And the idea of priority has a different meaning in a continuous time world than it has in a quantized time world. If we're inside an elevator and the door opens for all of us, priority has a meaning because we can sort ourselves out while we're inside the elevator and when the door opens, the person with greatest priority goes through first. That's easy. What's harder is when you approach a door that doesn't have a specific time of opening. Well, the Asynchronous Research Center at Portland State has been established precisely to study the issues of how do we deal with asynchrony. What are the problems? What are some answers? What can it do for us? And we're using the fleet computing system as our driver. Before I left Sun, I had built two test chips, which demonstrate that indeed we can build asynchronous stuff that makes a communication net of the kind I described. And it runs fast as hell, by the way, because we don't have to distribute the clock anywhere. We simply, each part takes care of its own timing. We built another test chip that tests the essentially the, the dispatcher at a dock who sends information out onto the network or receives it and whose configuration is controlled by a programmer. And that also worked fine. So we think we're in a position now to actually build a piece of equipment that will have this strange property that the program for it, the configuration information for the communication net will be entirely concurrent. And I'm hoping that we can force some programming people to start thinking concurrently from the very bottom most level. And that that may help in thinking about concurrency at higher levels as well. Concurrency will be the rule and sequentiality will be available, but you will have to program it explicitly. That's exactly the reverse of what we're thinking about now where sequentiality is the rule and we find concurrency hard to do. Hmm. That's interesting. Imagine a chip which has several dozen core processors on it, each of which is sequential. Now we ask programmers to concurrentize their, quote, their code to run on inherently sequential machines. This sounds slightly like an oxymoron to me. I would much rather those individual parts could operate concurrently. And if I want sequentiality, I'll work hard to get it. That's the end of my remarks.
I'd be happy to answer a few questions. I think we have a little time for that. Yeah, hi, I'm Rick Farrow. I was at the um, Hot Par workshop in Berkeley last week, and one of the discussions they had there, well, actually one of the around the table, not formal discussions, was how to start teaching not just, not even concurrency, but just parallelism to students. And a professor at University of Maryland, I, um, Ulrich, I believe, he's, his point was that we should start teaching this to students in middle school. Because once you had gone down this road of learning how to write sequential code, it was very, very hard to change. So I wonder what you think of that. Obviously, you didn't grow up in a concurrent world except in operating systems. You grew up with sequential computers. So and you're, you're thinking about it. But I'm, I'm thinking about you know, programmers in general. I know for myself, I find functional programming very difficult because it isn't sequential or it doesn't appear to be. Yeah, I, I, I think those are great sentiments. I, I said earlier, and I really believe it, I have found unlearning things that I was trained in long ago much harder than learning new things. It's much easier to write on a blank sheet of paper than it is to erase what's already on the paper and then write on it. And so maybe we have to start in the middle school, I don't know. I, I hope that people in our field will be bright enough and intelligent enough to do the hard work of unlearning some of their you know, basic lessons and then figure, the hardest thing I ever did was to learn to tie my shoes right. Now I was a Boy Scout, right, and I knew the difference between a square knot and a granny. And when I was about 30 years old, I noticed that I always tied my shoes in a granny. The bow that I tied in my shoes turned out to be a granny knot. And I thought, how ugly is this? I am going to fix it so I tie my shoes in a square knot. That's very hard, very hard, because tying my shoes is something I, you know, I, that's a motor skill I learned when I was, you know, that high. And I was able to do it, but it took me a long time. That's the unlearning that's hard, and so maybe we have to start with the young people. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi, Wynne Treese. Um, I'm curious uh, what the state of your thinking so far is about the programming notation, the linguistic innovation that you need to program these, and what the, the work in the world on data flow systems and with things like the message passing interface, MPI, uh, has as uh, informing that. I think there's quite a lot been worked on in the data flow world. And you know, I, I'm the hardware half of this operation. I have to seek people like you to tell me what to do for the software half. But there are some programs being written. And certainly, just looking at what I can build with networks, I can see that we can get enormous performance. I expect that the first programming languages we have are going to be pretty crude until we get the right set of ideas. But I remind you that the pipe in Unix is awfully easy to use. And I think we're drawing on that paradigm to try and figure out what the configuration should be. One description of Fleet that I've heard that I like a lot is that it's a packet-switched FPGA. You know, a field programmable gate array is a wonderful thing. You put some bits into it which configure its communication paths, and then it can do any set of logic that it's configured for. But the configuration bits are very difficult to get in. There's lots of them, for one thing. And they're built into the FPGA in a way that they can be slow in order for the communication paths that they configure to be fast. And in Fleet, we've made a different compromise. The configuration bits that configure the communication channels are themselves data which can be dealt with in the very same switching network as regular data. It's a von Neumann machine in the sense that one man's program is another man's data. FPGAs aren't like that. So it's packet switched. And I think there's going to be quite a lot learned about how to deal with those packets and how to deal with the inherent concurrency that they give you. I don't know all the software answers. 
we knew all the answers, it wouldn't be worth doing the research, right? Thank you. So I listened to you describe fleet. Can you I, tell us who you are? I'm sorry, I'm Gary Cutbill from uh, Quanta Research. Um, I listened to you describe fleet, and it, I think I have an intuition about how you could have a process that runs on a fleet. But it also seemed to me that there are processes which would maybe only need half of the ships that were available, and I might want to therefore be able to bring a second process in and, and make use of the, the rest of the system. Has there been any notion of thinking about sort of multiple processes running simultaneously on a fleet? And dare I use the word, how you would schedule them uh, in, a, in an asynchronous world? I, I understand the question. The question is basically, what about the protection of one process from another? I think that was implied in your yes. description. You know, in 1963, I was in MIT as a graduate student, just finished in 1963. And at that time, time sharing was a hot topic. Memory protection was just being invented. And the question of how do I keep your program from treading on mine was a hot research topic. Now, I think in fleet, we're not yet at the point to figure that out. I expect it will be done by marking data and having, you know, sentinels around that say, you know, you're the wrong kind of data for this particular job. But I don't know that yet. I'm just at the stage of wanting to build the very first machine. Sure. Okay, I'm back in the Morris Wilkes era, but with a different technology. So I just don't know the answer. Okay, I seem to have run out of questions, so let's go do something else. <laughs>